And we'll just give it a couple minutes for folks to join. And I do ask that you remain muted. evening we keep letting guests in and to remind you to remain muted during the presentation All right, a couple more minutes. Okay, I think we are good to go. All right, good evening, and thank you for attending this evening's virtual lecture. My name is Galen Kinsey, and I'm the scheduling coordinator at White Mountain Research Center in Bishop, California. I will be hosting this event as a representative on W as a rep excuse me representative of WMRC and the California. Native Plant Society's Bristlecone chapter. This talk will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel on a later date. The link to watch will be posted at wmrc.edu. As a reminder, I ask that all participants remain muted and keep their cameras off during the presentation. We will have a Q&A after the presentation where you can either raise your hand or ask a question in the chat. Firstly, I would like to give a land acknowledgement. UCWMRC acknowledges the Numu, Paiute, and Newe Shoshone as the first peoples and traditional land stewards of Paiute, Hunaru, and Coho, the Owens Valley and White Mountains. As a facility managed by a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the elders, and relations of past, present, and emerging. With that being said, I would like to introduce this evening's speaker. Perry Lee Pipkin is a graduate student at Cal Botanics Botany Program through Claremont University. She is a 2022 WMRC Mini Grant, grant recipient and a 2002 CNPS Bristlecone Chapter Decker Botanical Grant recipient. 
Tonight, she will be presenting her work titled Black Holes, White Gold, a Floristic Inventory of the Silver Peak Range, Esmeralda County, Nevada, in which she will discuss her 2022 fieldwork in the Silver Peak Range of Nevada, where she is creating a floristic inventory that will better inform land management and conservation efforts. Perry, you have the podium. Thanks so much, Gaylene. Um, so welcome everyone and thanks for joining in this evening. Um, my name is Perry Lee and I'm a second year master's student at the California Botanic Garden. And I'm very excited to share my research on this understudied area in the backyard of the Owens Valley with all y'all tonight. Um, I'm very grateful to have been supported by the, both the Wright Mountains Research Center and the CNPS Bristol Cone Pine Chapter. I spent this past year working on writing a flora in the Silver Peak Range of Esmeralda County, Nevada. Um, and I'll be starting my second season of collecting as soon as this snow melts. So I wanted to give a brief overview of what writing a flora or a floristic study is for anyone unfamiliar with this type of research. A floristic study is a systematic inventory of all plants in a designated area verified with vouchered herbarium specimens which are then deposited into and stored in herbaria for future reference and research. The end product of this type of study is a voucher-based checklist and an accessible archived collection of important vouchered specimens. Some floras only focus on vascular plants of an area, but in my flora, I'm also including mosses to the best of my ability in order to provide the most complete botanical picture possible. So as I've just mentioned, a floristic inventory um, is a systematic inventory, which is an important data that can provide land managers, researchers, and other interested people with baseline botanical information. They are voucher-based, referenceable checklists of plants and a sort of proof of occurrence. These data can then go on to inform future research, identify areas or species in need of conservation action, and also be very helpful for land managers for determining appropriate land use to avoid damage to sensitive species and ecosystems. Documenting and protecting plant diversity is critical for ecological resilience and for preserving biodiversity in our deserts. So as we can see, herbarium collections and floristic studies are very important, but they're not systematically carried out or evenly distributed throughout the West. If you would please cast your gaze towards Nevada on this map, you'll notice what we call a botanical black hole. In the whole of Nevada, vascular botanical specimen collection density is estimated at just 0.34 specimens per kilometer squared on average. Compare this to other neighboring states such as California, which is well collected at 4.76 specimens per kilometer squared, and you'll see disparity in all available data. This map is slightly dated. However, the estimated specimen density is not expected to change significantly with current digitization efforts. Botanical black holes are problematic because without any baseline data to work with, land management agencies can run into conflicts with sensitive resources or end up permitting resource use endeavors that may damage or extirpate rare and endangered species. So before we get into any details about the Silver Peak Range and the significance of the flora in this research, I want to orient you to just where in the world the Silver Peak Range is. The Silver Peak Range is located on the western edge of Esmeralda County, which is located on the far western side of the state. This mountain range and surrounding valleys are the traditional and unceded homelands of the Northern Paiute, Western Shoshone, Timbisha Shoshone, and Eastern Mono people, who live nearby but without land rights to this region today. My study site is a roughly 450 square mile area that includes a 52 square mile wilderness study area. There are two main towns near the Silver Peak Range, Dyer on the west side, a census designated place of about 305 people, and Silver Peak on the east side, another census designated place of about 215 people of which I highly recommend visiting the town bar if you enjoy strange and off-color locales. This region sits in a transition zone between the Great Basin and Mojave Deserts, and it's in a double rain shadow of both the Sierras and the White Mountains. This leads to extreme aridity and low annual precipitation. 
This is a current view taken earlier this week from a new live cam installed on the ridgeline near Silver, Silver Peak, presumably near or at the radio tower, which is at about 9,300 feet. You can see the White Mountains there off in the distance. With all these recent atmospheric rivers, the Silver Peak Range is currently experiencing the most precipitation on record since recording began, which is about 200% of its historical record. At their highest point, the subalpine peaks of the Silver Peak Range reach about 9,374 feet in elevation. These mountains descend through canyons and cliffs into colorful palette of unique and unusual geology that bears both interesting plant communities and a wide array of habitats. The low elevations are primarily alluvial fans and low hills, and the terrain grows steeper and more rugged as you gain elevation. To the west of the mountains where you see those agricultural circles is the census designated place of Dyer in the Fish Lake Valley. This valley is home to alkali wetlands and seeps and adjacent to playas and hummocks. To the east of the mountains is the Clayton Valley, where you see the lithium ponds of Silver Peak, and it's the, the census-designated place of Silver Peak as well. In this valley, there are also hummocks, cinder cones, and sand dunes. So I wanted to include some satellite imagery from Google Earth to give you a sense of the topology and the diverse and colorful soil substrate and geology of the range. Here's some views of the colorful canyons and peaks throughout the range. And it's important to note that this isn't artist rendering, it's actual colors of the substrate. And so here's a real life shot of Piper Peak, the highest point in the range, in the background of the Fish Lake hot well here. The colorful geology of the rolling hills and the canyons is also very visible here in the background. And here in the foreground, I believe this is a white-faced ibis, but any bird enthusiasts are welcome to correct me. Here's a few more shots to highlight some of the dramatic geology and parts of the range that bear red rock canyons and windswept formations. Seeing this diverse geology will set the stage for understanding the biodiversity that occurs here. As you can see, soil color and texture change rapidly in the study area, leading to fairly regular changes in vegetation. On the left is Argentite Canyon, a very rough and winding volcanic route up to the peaks and one of the entrances into the wilderness study area. And on the right is an open area of desert featuring rapid substrate changes indicated by the color and the change in soil color and textures. The area also supports an abundance of wildlife, such as bighorn sheep, coyotes, badgers, gophers, kit foxes, mule deers, pronghorns, feral horses, various birds and waterfowl, rattlesnakes, lizards, and more. In addition, the rare fish lake tui chub, a type of fish, occurs in the valley alkali wetlands. The Silver Peak Range also has a lot of evidence that it has been inhabited by humans for a long time. In recent history, there are several mines, ruins, and artifacts such as cans and bottles observed in the field that tell of mining and ranching communities using the area. In addition to this, the higher elevation mountains have hundreds of arrowheads littered throughout the area, and evidence of flint napping mines were also seen. Other evidence observed in the field, such as the presence of stands of lomation or biscuit root species, suggests that this area is culturally important as hunting lands and wild tended gardens. Additionally, the area is forested by stands of pinyon pine, which is another culturally important food crop for the area tribes. So now we'll move on to the plants of the area. The area is characterized by several different plant community types, and it ranges from about 4,500 feet to 9,400 feet in elevation. In the lower elevations, from around 4,500 to 5,000 feet, there are several large groundwater dependent alkali wetlands and salt marshes that support plants such as the Tacopa's bird's beak, various native grasses, Ivesia, shooting stars, and Mojave thistles. An interesting plant in the wetlands is Tacopa's bird's beak, or Chloropyron tecopensi. It's a rare and threatened partially parasitic herb restricted to salt encrusted desert wetlands and marshes. It's only found in the Amargosa River Basin, which is on the California-Nevada border, and in Fish Lake Valley of Esmeralda County, Nevada. 
These two hydrological basins are separated by multiple mountain ranges and about 150 miles as the crow flies. In both locations, these groundwater dependent ecosystems provide critical habitat for wildlife and specialized plant communities. Studies of closely related chlorpyrin species show that they maintain community level diversity by suppressing dominant species, highlighting, highlighting the importance of, of conserving these hemiparasitic plants in their place. As groundwater dependent ecosystems are critical biodiversity lifelines within the desert, chlorpyrin tecopensi plays a role in enhancing and maintaining this unique biodiversity. I'm currently working on a conservation plan for chlorpyrin tecopensi which will provide actionable steps in the assistance of the population stabilization and conservation of this rare and threatened species. It will also be useful for, to petition this species for federal endangered species listing. We'll rise in elevation now from the wetland bearing valleys into the 5,000 to 7,500 foot range. In this elevational gradient, there are desert washes and alluvial fans, flats, lower foothills and ravines that range from Joshua tree scrub to Lycium atriplex communities. The cactus diversity is the highest in this elevation and both the ephemeral and perennial spring wildflowers are very abundant in this elevational zone as well. Here is the Mojave Aster on Earthquake Dome overlooking the Fish Lake Valley alfalfa farms with the, with the White Mountains off in the distance. And this is along the main road up to Silver Peak at the intersection of a wash. The washes often have many scattered annual and perennial wildflowers. There are also many carbonate rich deposits in the range, fairly commonly in occurrence, lending to some interesting limestone endemics such as the limestone jewel flower and the naked stem sunray. This is another carbonate outcropping. And so you can see how the soil, the soil changes rapidly to a white color here. This is an interesting aster, the fine leaf woolly wife or Hymenopappus filifolius, which is a very tall and showy plant. As we move up to 6,500 feet in elevation, sagebrush and cliff rows begin to dominate the hilly landscape. Pinyon juniper woodlands begin to appear around 7,500 feet and canyons with willows, wild roses, and cottonwoods are present. Prickly poppies, alliums, and multiple phacelia species also become very common. Some interesting species such as Barnaby's penstemon occur around these elevations. These silver peak populations of the plant are among the furthest southwest of extent in their range in Nevada. Another interesting species occurring here is the yellow prepucia, Ivesia arizonica, variety arizonica. Many of the plants in this range exhibit unusual lysiniate petals. And so here's some weather rolling into the pinyon juniper woodland in McAfee Canyon, one of the largest drainages in the cro and cross mountain roads in the range. This canyon has some interesting plants that are more commonly seen in the Sierras and the White Mountains, such as fern bush and wax currants. This canyon is dominated by large boulders, dramatic washes, and pinyon scrubs, and is a great adventure if you have a four-wheel drive vehicle. There are also several seeps, springs, and riparian areas around these elevations that support moss, saxifrage, equisetum, and fern populations. The riparian areas in the mountains range from large spring fed pools to surface water streams to simply damp areas. Unfortunately, many of these areas within reasonable road access have been heavily disturbed and or destroyed through the creation of kettle troughs. Here in the center, you can see a bulldozed spring surrounded by barbed wire and a spring converted into a cow trough. Multiple dead wildlife were also observed in the trough at many locations. So this here in the mid elevation riparian zone is the tallest waterfall in the Silver Peak range, which flows into Silver Lake and feeds a vibrant riparian area. It majestically stands at about four and a half feet tall. And here is Dr. Naomi Fraga, also at Upper Cow Camp, 
Um, the grasses, rushes, and sedges are so dense here and lined with such lush wild rose stands that it has the feel of an inappropriately placed golf course. So now we'll climb into the higher elevations up around 7,500 feet. Here, the lupins, fritillaria, and holodiscus begin to appear. The peaks are dominated by phlox, lupins, sulfur buckwheats, and dense pinion and sagebrush stands. Two stands of bristlecone pines have been documented and one historical stand remains to be relocated. On the top of Piper Peak, there is also a vernal pool. I didn't manage to make it up there while there was still water in it during my first season, but I'm hoping to improve my timing with this and catch it in this next coming season. So this is a Puntia polyacantha, the plains prickly pear, up around 9,000 feet overlooking the Clayton Valley and the lithium brine pools outside of the town of Silver Peak. And here is the Phacelia crenulata, the notched leaf scorpion reed with Silver Peak visible in the background at around 9,000 feet again. And this was a small buckwheat on the ridge line between Silver Peak and Red Mountain. I think this might be Ariogonum ovalifolium, but I'm a little stuck in the key, so any buckwheat enthusiasts, please reach out. The Silver Peak Range is known to have floristic influences from the neighboring Sylvania and White Mountains and could provide further biogeographical context to both of these regions. It also has biogeographic affinities with California, seen by the presence of species more representative of the state, such as the White Mountains cat's eye. This species was thought to be endemic to California, but occurs within the study site, making this plant a state record for Nevada and a potential candidate for rare plant listing status. In addition, there are multiple stands of Western Joshua trees, which primarily occur in California, and presumably more species yet to be uncovered. A systematic study of the floor of the Silver Peak Range will provide further information about the distribution of rare plants that straddle the state border and could provide documentations of species that are currently thought to be endemic to California and have yet to be observed in Nevada. So moving on to the threats happening in the area, several existential threats are present here and several lower grade threats impact the area as well. I will go into the top three concerns in more detail, but as an overview and in order of severity, the most immediate conservation issue in the Silver Peak Range is the proposed hard rock lithium mine at Rhyolite Ridge and the lithium brine extraction exploration in the Fish Lake Playa. Next is a proposed geothermal development project in the Fish Lake Valley. After that, grazing and the associated alteration of water sources severely impacts the ecology of the region. Non-native plants have also been introduced to the area through grazing and mining and pose threat to the sensitive and more rare native species of the area, as they tend to be more robust competitors for water and nutrients. In addition to this, climate change is a general overarching concern for the flora of this region as it is in many others. So the Silver Peak Range has a long history of mining and it's one of the oldest mining districts in Nevada. The mining town of Silver Peak was established in 1864 and the first mines opened in 1865. At one point in its history, the Pittsburgh mine just outside of the Silver Peak, out of Silver Peak, was the highest producing gold mine in Nevada. This mine shut down in 1915 due to a lack of ores, and today there are many abandoned mines scattered throughout the mountains. Today, there's an active open gold, an open pit gold mine and mineral ridge and a lithium brine operation owned by the North Carolina company Albemarle outside of the town of Silver Peak. This is currently the only lithium producer operating within the US. Lithium brine prospecting is currently occurring in the Fish Lake Valley. Alteration of the groundwater in this area for lithium brine extraction ponds would not only impact the local wetlands, it would likely cause extinction of the rare plant Chloropyrantecopensi and the endemic Fish Lake Tui Chub. This would also negatively impact the water available to the local communities. Currently, the Rhyolite Ridge project proposed by the Ioneer Mining Company of Australia 
poses an existential threat to the rare and endemic Teams buckwheat, which is found exclusively in the Silver Peak Range of Esmeralda County. Teams buckwheat was just granted protection under the Federal Endangered Species Act due to the proposed mine at Rhyolite Ridge. However, the Bureau of Land Management approved, uh, approved the mine. The current plan would extend the mine into critical habitat and comes within four meters or 13 feet of the plants, which violates protections granted under the Federal Endangered Species Act. You can see here on this map, the green stripes, stripes are the critical habitat. The tiny green slivers are plant populations. The gray area is the proposed quarry and the yellow and the pink are the overburden and spent ore storage facilities. So oh, I'll go back one more. As you can see in this map, the proposed Rhyolite Ridge lithium mine would create an open pit deep enough to quote the Center for Biological Diversity to hold the Eiffel Tower, surrounded by the equivalent of 1,000 football fields of mining waste. This destruction would ring the plant's main locations on three sides, creating what has been colloquially called buckwheat Island. The loss of habitat, increase of particle dust, and encroachment of machinery and waste into the critical habitat would doom the plant into extinction. Lithium is a high demand mineral as it's a component in our batteries found in everyday technology such as cell phones and electric vehicles. And the current boom in sourcing this material has been dubbed the white gold rush. So another threat to biodiversity in the area is the geothermal energy development. Exploration for geothermal power stations is underway in the Fish Lake Valley by the Chinese company Kaishan, which means open mountain energy. The Fish Lake hot well and Fish Lake salt marsh would be directly impacted by this proposed geothermal energy station which would lower groundwater levels and impact the groundwater dependent ecosystems where species such as chloropyrin pecopensi grow. As of yesterday, a geothermal exploration proposal was approved by the BLM for the company ORMAT east of the Fish Lake Playa. Alteration of the groundwater in this area could cause extirpation of rare and threatened species present in those sensitive wetlands. And so grazing is another common practice in the area, and much of the local economy in Dyer is supported through the production of alfalfa to feed livestock. Cows are found almost everywhere in the range and cause damage to the springs and the sensitive species found in them through trampling, wallowing, and grazing. However, the full extent of this damage is unknown. In addition to the direct trampling and grazing caused by cattle, many springs and other water sources have been impacted to create cattle troughs. Many springs have also been bulldozed or otherwise destroyed and altered from their original states. Because of this, cattle pose threat to the plant diversity of the area. In January of 2023, the Center for Biological Diversity sued the BLM as cattle were grazing in the protected team's buckwheat habitat, causing damage to the threatened plants. So unfortunately, much like Nevada itself, the extent of the Silver Peak Range's flora is largely underdocumented. Baseline biological data is urgently needed to inform land management and policy decisions to maximize the protection of biodiversity. The herbarium specimens that I am collecting can be used to inform appropriate land use, which in turn can reduce conflicts with sensitive resources such as rare plants and ecological communities. Before starting collections, I wanted to look at who had been collecting in the region and what they had collected. I compiled data from the CCH2 or the California Consortium of Herbaria and the SayNet database to get lists of original collections, who had collected them and where they were collected and when. Before starting my field season in the spring of 2022, there were a total of 753 vouchered collections made in the area representing about 311 taxa. These collections primarily occurred along areas with road access. So the earliest collector in the area was William Shockley, who made one collection of chloropyrin tecopensi in 1888. At the time of this collection, that chloropyrin tecopensi 
specimen was mixed into collections of a different plant, Corylanthus myrtabum subspecies canescens, and remained undetected for many decades. Since that first collection in 1888, only about 49 vouchered herbarium collections were made in the area until the 1980s, when Arnold's team began to collect in the area. Today, the most prolific collector in the region is Jerry Team, who collected in the area between 1981 and 1994, making about 296 collections to his name and another 46 with other collectors for a total of 342 collections. He's followed by a list of many big names in botany. In addition to this, there are around 401 iNaturalist observations made both recently and retroactively uploaded, accounting for the past 20 years in the area. This represented around 201 taxa. Both of these taxon lists gave me an idea of what I might be looking for and what areas I needed to target. You can see that these observations are also primarily along areas with road access. And so these are some of the top observers in the area before I started working on this project. And here on the right is an interesting plant that I really like in the area, the skunky monkey flower, or Diplicus mephisticus, which is a really cool plant because although these two plants have different flower colors, they're actually the same species. And this is exhibiting a trait is what's known as flower color polymorphism, where the same species can bloom in two different colors. So during my field season, I made around 1900 vouchered collections at my site during around seven, 65 to 70 field days. This resulted in 1,180 iNaturalist observations representing around 341 taxa bringing the total known taxa in the area to 431. Because the process of creating vouchered specimens does not have a quick turnaround time, I used iNaturalist to help me track the species I'd seen and to share this information with botanists and other enthusiasts in the area. This information also helped me create a visual representation of areas I had traveled through and areas in need of further collecting. So you can see, while I managed to make many collections, I still have many more areas to travel into for this upcoming season. And here on the bottom left is my uh, QR code to my iNaturalist link. And I'll show this again at the end of the presentation if you don't have your phone out and ready to visit the link. And so there were so many exciting plants in this range, it was hard to pick out a few prime cuts to share with all y'all tonight. But here on the left, we have Meadow Stars or Hesperochiron californicus, which is more common in the Sierra Nevadas and less so in Nevada. And I think this collection might be a county record. On the right is the woolly desert marigold, Thalia planaradiata, which has scattered occurrences in Esmeralda County, but is more common in the deserts of Southern Nevada, Arizona, and California. California. This cute little cushion here on the left is Shockley's buckwheat, which is fairly uncommon except in carbonate outcroppings. And on the right is Oxystylus lutea, the spiny caper. This plant is common in the Amargosa and Ash Meadows and near Tacopa. So this is very far north for this plant to be occurring. Here's another really charming little plant on the left, Linanthus campanulata or the Belgilia which is found primarily in Esmeralda and central western Nevada, Inyo County in California. On the right is Rhinotropsis intermontana, the intermountain milkwort, which had scattered distribution in the Silver Peaks and is primarily scattered throughout mountainous areas in Nevada, Utah, and eastern California. I was also really excited to see this least, strap, uh, least snapdragon, Cyrocarpus kingii, it's not generally uncommon, but it was very uncommon in the range, and I've only found one in one wash so far. That might change with all this snow and precipitation this year that the range has received. And on the right is Navarretia brewerii, the yellow pincushion plant, which was another exciting find for me, as I don't think it's been collected in the Silver Peaks or in Esmeralda County before. So my 2020 three field season is projected to begin sometime in mid to late April. And if it goes anything like last year, May and June will be my busiest months. 
From July to October, I plan to make shorter weekly or biweekly expeditions into the area as well. And I'll be primarily focusing on target species, such as those 65 taxa that remain to be relocated. And we're making longer backpacking trips into the wilderness study area. That area has no roads, so travel is much more rugged and slow. I also plan to visit and revisit every peak this spring and summer, prioritizing the vernal pool and the very steep red mountain. And I'm also planning to host an iNaturalist bio blitz at some point in May or June based on the precipitation and the snow melt. So stay tuned if you're interested in joining for that. So what will become of all this research? At the end of my master's work, I'll be publishing a flora of the Silver Peak Range in the journal Aliso. And my iNaturalist ident uh, observations will contribute to a greater public understanding of the area. In addition to this, I'm working with an ecological artist local to the Claremont and LA area to produce illustrations of the plants and ecology in the area to showcase the unique biodiversity in this corner of Nevada. And so as you can see, fieldwork is very fun and I'm actively recruiting volunteers. Here you can see we successfully unpinned someone's truck from a rock, found some luxury accommodations, flattened a few tires, and only lost the field press one time. But we got many amazing sunsets, wildflowers, and hot spring soaps. I'd like to extend a big thanks to my field assistants that came out and helped me during my first season. I couldn't fit a photo of everyone, but everyone who did come out into the field was a huge help, and they're listed here. If you're interested in coming out to the Silver Peak Range, please reach out. I'd love to have you and I can tailor days to fit people's physical comfort, le comfort levels when possible. And, and I'd like to thank uh, all the organizations, including the White Mountain Research Center, um, as I'm a recipient of their mini grant and their generous support has made logistics and much of my research possible. And I'd also like to thank the California Native Plant Society, Bristol Cone Chapter, for their generous support in funding my project with their Mary Decker Bot Botanical Grant. Without everyone, this work would not have been possible. Um, and so this is a QR code link, and um, my acknowledgement page is actually missing from this, but I can put it up later. <laughs> but thanks for tuning in, everyone. Thank you, Perry. Um... I also shared the URL for your project in the chat. So if folks want to just open it up in a tab and not use their phone. Okay, uh, yeah, awesome. Yeah, and then if if you want, we can figure out how to collect interest with volunteering for your bio blitz and collect collections this year, this season. Um, and right now we can do a Q and A. Um, Everyone is welcome to participate. You can submit a question in the chat or you can use the raise your hand feature and we can go about it that way. I really did enjoy this. It was just very visually pleasing. Um, Nevada does not get enough credit for its biodiversity because it really is a beautiful place. Um, you know, I live 70 miles from where you're um doing your work and yeah Nevada is just really it's a really neat place so um does anyone have any questions oh we have lots of you know lots of accolades um oh yeah yeah and the yellow-headed bastard <laughs> I only thought I only thought people were like that with asters so <laughs> um. okay um let's see So Dylan, thanks. I'll look and I'll look at that areogonum and see see where oh, that one goes. <laughs> she said like overfolium. Um, I think we really have a problem with the mining law of 1872 with these yeah. conservation projects. Um, you know, it's affecting the Buckwheat uh, conglomerate Mesa area, Hot Creek, Hot Creek mine just to name a more, you know, some more recent um, projects. So um, I, I'm really curious, like how, how did the BLM approve a geothermal project then if it's not related to that mining law? 
Um, I don't exactly know the how all of this is happening, but I think a lot of it is um, Nevada is very friendly to resource extraction and Esmeralda is very interested in um, developing lands for extraction. And so the, um, the, so if you've heard about GreenLink West, there's a plan to run a high power energy transmission line from, I believe it's like, uh, it, they want the GreenLink West, GreenLink North, and maybe GreenLink East or something, but it's connecting the whole state and running Reno to Las Vegas, like a high, gigantic transmission line. And that way, all of these re remote and rural energy projects, such as solar and um, geothermal and all these types of projects can directly feed in and supply energy to the cities. And it's like green energy in theory, but in practice, it's actually just like massive ecosystem destruction. And so it's really complicated where you're, I mean, it's, you know, these lands don't need to be sacrificed. We have plenty of like rooftops for solar and parking lots for solar. And like, do we need to suck every last bit of water out of the ground to turn into energy? It's a long, it's a larger conversation. Um, and this is just happening in a county that prioritizes the resource extraction over conservation efforts. And there's not a lot of people in Esmeralda County. So it's fairly easy to pass this kind of thing. Like they say, you can't eat money. So um, mm -hmm. we do have some questions in the chat now, if you would like me to read them to you and you can answer if you would like. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, we have a question from George. Hi, George, thanks for coming again. Um, George is asking, what makes you consider the area as a transition zone between the Mojave and Great Basin? Um, so the Mojave Desert uh, kind of, we get a lot of Mojave Desert influence in the southern edge of, edge of the Silver Peaks. And we see this with species such as the Western Joshua tree. And there's a lot of annuals more typical to the Mojave Desert. So if we kind of like, looking at a lot of the plants that occur there, they're at the northern edge of their range. Um, and this is like right at the edge of the Mojave. Um, and then it start, you start to see these species such as sagebrush and pinyon pine and um, atroplex and things more characteristic of the basin and range province, which is more of what Nevada, the dominant, um, I guess the dominant desert of Nevada is more basin and range. And so this edge sort of lays right on top of the mountain. So you'll see this mixture of Mojave Desert wildflowers at the very edge of their range. And then you see these great basin plants at the edge of their range as well. So I guess it's just, we're seeing plants at the edge of their ranges, which is how we kind of can tell that it is a transition zone. I hope that was helpful. I'm not sure if that, yeah, let me know <laughs> if you want me to go further. I'll, I'll keep an eye out in the chat. Cool. Um, so Seal, hi Seal. Seal's a very local, knowledgeable naturalist. Um, she says, Stellar Project, has anyone explored insect fauna of the area? Um, so I know that not to a huge extent, but there is one biologist um, who's very active on iNaturalist. Um, his name is Corey. Corey Lang, I believe, but if you check out, so I also have a side project that is the, uh, the animals of the Silver Peak range. I can't remember if I titled it the fauna or the animals, but it's on iNaturalist and it's an umbrella. So it just grabs everyone's animal observations. And he is constantly uploading beetles and insects. And so I don't think that there is like an official exploration, but he's a very active participant. And that would be a great um, resource as well. Um, yeah, I can, I'll try to find the link to my other project. I visit it less often because often it's not plants, but it's just my like side pet project. Um, yeah. Awesome. Let's see, George has another question. Yeah. How would you, how would you check out the floor without road access? That's a great question. So I will do a lot of hiking. Um, and so there are some main roads that go into the area. There's three, 
major roads that cross over the mountain range. Um, two, to, two are kept fairly in good condition. And from there I can hike off to the peaks um, or I can hike, I can drive to the edge of bad roads and hike further. So there, it's not so remote that I can't even access the mountains at all, but it is remote enough that I park and then do long hikes in. So it's a lot of travel by foot. How heavy does that plant press get? <laughs> oh, it gets really heavy. I, I'm trying to commission a seamstress to like build me a, a plant press backpacking backpack so I don't have to carry this cross shoulder. It sort of feels like a corset, you know, it's like constricting and I'm like, there has to be a better way. So if any of you are talented seamstresses, I'm interested in talking to you. Awesome, let's see, David McMullen has a comment saying that he's looking forward to assisting you with your work when the time comes. So I yeah. think- And I can send out an email um, to the, the research station. Um, I have a field schedule up. So you're also welcome to send me an email directly. And um, I, I can send you the rough schedule and you can get an idea of like where we'll be going. It's of course all weather dependent and like could shift around a little bit, but we have a general idea of where we're going and when based off of last year. So it might be slightly later this year. Um, yeah. I do have a list, um, an email list of everyone that is registered for this talk. So we do have your email addresses if you would like to get in contact with any of us uh, about Perry's project. Um, see, George has another question. Do you observe the cactus diversity in the cactus flat and like what elevation? Yeah. So the, the most of the cactus diversity occurs between 4,500 and probably like 7,000 feet. Um, and it really changes. Uh, so like some of the cactuses really love the washes and the open alluvial plains, but some really love these cliffs and, um, and so, like there's just kind of depending on what part of the range you're in, there's different cactus. Uh, and there's one rare cactus that I'm actually looking for this year. So if you're a cactus enthusiast and want to come hunting, we're looking for Sclerocactus niensis because there is a, it occurs on the other side of the Clayton Valley and there's substrate matches in the Silver Peak Range at the same elevation. And it's only like 15 miles away. So we think it's there, but we're not sure. So it's a treasure hunt if you're, anyone's interested. A hot, a hot treasure hunt, <laughs> it'll be sunny. Okay, we just shared our public email if anyone wants to get a hold of you, Perry, or any other questions. Um, yeah, and then George is asking, uh, what what background are you looking for in your volunteers? Like, what what what, what are you looking for? <laughs> yeah, so if you want to just come out for the day, it's it's helpful if you have like good plant eyes um, or if you're excited to learn and you just want to look at plants. Um, so I always can use more people to help me spot plants that I might have missed, but also sometimes just somebody to hold the plant press still while I try to strap it down is an incredibly helpful person to have in the field. So if you're like, I don't really have a ton of plant skills, but I, um, it is fairly rugged terrain. So I would say um, you, if you would like to come out, you should be able to hike for at least a couple miles on off trail. Um, but other than that, if, as long as you're excited and you're excited to look at plants and take photos and put them on a naturalist and hold a field press for me, I would love to have you out there. If you're good at closing a suitcase. Yeah. A press. Similar skills, similar skill set. Um, well, let's see, you know, we have one more talk this year. Um, it was rescheduled because winter will not stop. Um, it's rescheduled for April 6th with Sue Burrick and she will be discussing, um, 
you know, our weather patterns we've been experiencing this winter with atmospheric rivers and how that ties into um, our avalanche activity and climate change. Um, you can register for that talk on our website, wmrc.edu. There is also a link on our Facebook page if you follow it. And this talk is being recorded and I will post it on a later date on our YouTube channel. And you'll also be able to find the link on our website, um, Perry. So if you would like to share this with other folks, it'll be available. Um, let's see, I've got a couple more messages. Yes, um, Tom says, you know, an excellent choice of area to study. <laughs> Yeah. And Kathleen, a very interesting area. Oh, more accolades. <laughs> Did I say sclerocactus nances? Sorry, I say something else. I meant to say sclerocactus nances, but I don't know if that's what came out of my mouth. But that's what we're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, thanks everyone. It's it's I see some familiar names in the chat and I really appreciate it. I hope we can all like meet in person soon too. Um yeah. You know, this would make your work would make a great field guide too. I would love to make one. It'd be very That's fun. Always the ultimate goal. And then to even go further. Um, like an ethnobotany project because yeah. of the diversity in the area. Wow, just great. Um, well, I'm going to see if we have any more questions. And then if not, we can adjourn for the evening and go enjoy our dinners and relax. Um, thank you, Denise. Thanks, Dee Dee. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, if it weren't for you guys, you know, our attendees, you are always appreciated. Um, yeah, so I think with that, are I think we ready to go to bed for the night? <laughs> Thank you All so right. much, everyone. I really appreciate everyone's attendance. Thanks so much. All right, until next time, have a good one, everyone. <laughs> Bye.